was so now it was so awesome that I got to sit there because I had been playing in between things to preach. I was really, really working on getting the mind of the Lord. And then when I heard that word and when I heard what Pastor Lydia was sharing, I knew that I had picked the right, that, that I had heard God. My assignment today is within the next few moments to share with you on when life isn't always fair. How many of you know life is not always fair? Amen. Can you turn to the, your neighbor on your left and your right and tell them you know life is not always fair? No, I'm, I'm in the process of sharing some things with you. And I'm only going to share things with you that when life hasn't been fair to me, these are the things that I've done. And these are the things that God has used to get me out of whatever situation this situation puts me in. Because there's been times in my life that life has not been fair to me. I thought for many years that as a pastor, the least God could do for me is make sure life was good to me. And God did the opposite. He took me to the scripture and reminded me that the rain falls on the just and on the unjust. And I said, really? And I was serious about that. Now the things I share with you, please understand that I'm, I'm sharing with them sharing them with you as humble as I know how to be. I'm not trying to be nasty and I'm not trying to judge anybody. I'm simply sharing with you what God shared with me and how it helped me. Is that okay? Yes. Are you happy? Yes. Are you okay? Yes. Why don't we just give God one more praise before we start? So the question this morning would be, what are you going to do when life is just not fair to you? Now there's a lot of you that need to hear this message. Look at me. You need to hear this message. You don't need to hear your neighbor. You need to hear the Holy Spirit. And if your neighbor is talking to you while the Holy Spirit is trying to minister to you, just tell him to be quiet for a moment. Be brave enough to do that. Because your neighbor, without knowing, can easily rob you of what God wants to speak to your heart. Your phone can steal from you two seconds. And that's all it takes for God to give you your breakthrough and you'll miss it. Talking to one another. Talking to one another for, for two minutes. The devil will use that to cause you to not to hear what you need to hear to get you out of the situation that an unfair life has put you into. Are you still happy? Yes. What are you going to do when life isn't fair? What are you going to do when life doesn't play along? I personally believe in the abundant life that Jesus came to give us. Amen. John 10.10. 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And Jesus went on and said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And I know that we all know this scripture. It's part of. I believe it's part of our core belief here at Destiny Community that Jesus came to give us life and to give it more abundantly. And yet, the same Jesus also told us in John 16, 33, that in the world you will have tribulation. In this world you'll have temptations. You'll have trials. And he said, but be 
of good cheer. Now, I want you to hear this. You need to write this down. He said, be of good cheer. The literal Greek text reads, but have courage. In this life, you will have tribulation, but have courage. In Mark 4, Jesus reveals to us that when God began to bring his word into your life, that temptation, trials, persecutions, afflictions, tried to choke that word out of you, that the pressure due to circumstances would rise against you to try to separate you from the very word, the very relationship that God wants you to have. So we know that there's this great abundant life, amen, amen. that Jesus wants us to have. And yet, we also know that there will be times when life just isn't fair. Now, now I don't believe that life is always full of crummy stuff and bad stuff. and I don't believe that. But there's times that life just is not fair. One of my favorite Psalms, Psalms 23, the 23rd Psalm, there are six phenomenal verses in that Psalm. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and, and the way that I look at it, the way that I look at it helps me to kind of keep the right perspective in life. By that I mean one half of the verse talks about crummy stuff. The other five and a half verses are over the top. And I often tell people when they come to counseling, when they're at marriage, for example, I often tell them, isn't it interesting that if you would just reflect for a brief moment, you would agree with me that we've had, you've had more good times than you've had bad times. It's just that the devil uses the bad times to try and override the good times. And unfortunately, many people will not remember you for the good things that you've done. Unfortunately, many people will remember you for the bad things that you've done, but not God. And so you have five tremendous verses against one bad verse. And guess what verse many Christians stay on? The one bad verse. Let me show you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me, he guides me, he restores me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me, he guides me, he restores me. And yea, though I walk through the, the, the valley of the shadow of death, bam, that for many people that kills the leading, the guiding, the restoring. <laughs> Are you still happy? Look at your neighbor and say, I'm so happy. <laughs> and yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will be with me, your rod and your staff will comfort me. I believe in life. I believe that there's a lot of good in life. Can I get an amen on that? And yet every once in a while, life just isn't fair. It doesn't want to play along. So I want to share with you what I have done when life, when I have felt that life has not been fair to me. Can I do that? It was two years ago that my wife and I had three of our sisters, family, go to be with the Lord. Two of my sisters and one of hers. And the hard thing was that it all happened in a matter of two months. It wasn't long after that that I was called upon to do a celebration of life for a very, very, very dear friend of mine that was not only a spiritual son of mine, but was in this church for many, many years. His whole family was in church. It was a hard time for my life. It was a hard time for me. It was a hard time for our church. Just like when my mother-in-law, I struggled so much when my mother-in-law went to be with the Lord. It was a hard time for me. It was a very hard time for my wife. And it was a very hard time for my church. 
We literally ran the ministry for I don't know how long out of a hospital room, her hospital room. We were there from morning till night believing God for a breakthrough and a miracle. And you know what? God gave us the breakthrough and the miracle. He took her home. I realized that all of this was starting to take a toll on me. My mind, my emotions, along with my thoughts, it was very hard for me to even be in church. It was a hard time for me. But as hard as it was for me to be in church, I knew that that's where we belonged. That's where I needed to be. We had to be in church. We knew that we had to go forward because after all, we had several hundred people come into church like this morning. And I am a pastor, so I am required to somehow deal with this and somehow stay focused and go forward and somehow be here to encourage you. Now, I understand that as a leader, I need to lead while I bleed. I understand that. I have no problem with that. I get that. But I remember being alone in my car one morning, and I put on some Christian music, and, and I just sat there for a few moments, and I began to pray. And I said, and I'll quote it to you, and please don't be offended or angry at me. But this is what I said. I said, Father, I can't screw this up. Help me. By this, I meant my life, my wife, my children, my church. And so I said, I cannot screw this up. I need your help. And that's all I knew how to say at that moment. You've got to remember it was just a brief moment. And through that, I learned several amazing things. Now, please, I do understand that this is not the only way that you can handle this. But these things have worked for me and continue to work for me, and I'm praying that they'll work for you because God is not a respecter of persons. Can somebody kindly maybe go talk to one of those persons and, and let them know that we're having a church service and if they can just, if they can give us five hours, we'll be fine. Like, look, I said one, there's about 30 guys going. The neighborhood. There goes the neighborhood. <coughs> Tell them, I keep out of destiny community. <laughs> and so the first thing, and I need your attention, that I knew, and you can write it down. Number one, the first thing that I knew and that my wife and I knew the first thing that I knew is this. The Lord didn't have to remind me of this. I knew this in my heart already. I've practiced this for 40 something years. I've lived this. I knew this. So I was immediately taken. I remember Isaiah 40, 31. And most people know it and can quote it. And it says, they that gather together before the Lord shall renew their strength. I know, I know you're used to hearing <coughs> they that wait upon the Lord. But when you study that, you realize that the word wait is not a very strong translation. The Hebrew text says this, you want to write this down. They that gather before 
the Lord shall renew their strength. <laughs> They're that gather before the Lord. So I knew I had to go to church because I needed to gather with my brothers and sisters because they were good. God was going to use them to strengthen me and to encourage me and to speak into my life. And them, they that gather before the Lord. Now, he wasn't talking about, well, you know, what are you doing? Well, you know, I'm just, I'm just waiting. Well, what are you waiting on? Well, you know, I'm just, I'm just waiting on the Lord. That's not what he was talking about there. He's talking about gathering together. He's talking about something that God will do for your life, in your life, when you go to the house of God, that when you go to the house of God, you gather together. We gather together. He's not talking about two guys at Starbucks just talking. He's talking about the church. He's talking about what happens when you meet at your church house, when you gather together with the people of God and there. There in the gathering, when you gather together, God sat there in that gathering. Matthew says, when two or three gather together, I'll be in the midst of them. Right there, the Greek, ah, the Greek definition, the, write this down, the Greek definition for the word church. Jesus said, I'll build my church. The Greek definition of the word church is the gathering. We gather together. So when we gather together, we go to the house of God. We should go to church every week. Why do we have Sunday only people in this house? Why do so many forsake the gathering? In the rest of the opportunities during a week, a month, a year, why do we feel that God has said that it's okay to be a Sunday only Christian? And people don't feel bad about it. It doesn't bother them that it bothers God. It does not bother them. And sometimes to me, it lets me know a lot about their relationship with God. And oftentimes they tell me about, God revealed this to me. I believe God said this to me in my heart. I say, I don't believe that God can really speak to a one day a week Christian. Because if the truth be known, you're not, people are not in their word like they should be if the truth be known. If the truth be known, people don't have a private time to pray. If the truth be known, you don't have time to praise and worship God. And if the truth be known, you struggle. You struggle to come once a week and you always get here late. And I'm not being mean. I'm not. I'm not being judgmental. I'm just sharing with you what I had to go through when God used this to get me out, is this okay? How many of you love your pastor? And so God was saying, God was saying that when we gather together, the church, the gathering together, we should go to church every week, every opportunity. And when we get there, we should believe that because you were there, that now your strength will be renewed. Those that gather before the Lord will renew their strength, not those that stay away from the Lord. I do funerals and I do funerals and people come and they pay their respects and they hear the gospel and they understand what happened to the individual and yet they will not come. And my heart breaks for them. Because you see, 
I make it, every celebration of life I'm asked to do, I make it a point. I make it a point. I make it a mission in my life to tell them about Jesus and how much he loves them. And so we turn it into a celebration rather than a, a time of mourning. So it says, they that gather, Mario, they that gather before the Lord shall renew their strength. It doesn't say they that stay away from the church, the gathering together, that, that, that if they stay away, God will renew their strength. No, it doesn't say that. It says they that gather together with the rest of the gathering, there, right there, right there and then, they shall renew their strength. Oh, you can go ahead and praise him if you want. I know you want to. And, and, and church, because, because your strength is renewed. Oh, I forgot about this. How many of you say checks in the mail? We got a check today for $200 for donations for bicycles. That doesn't mean that cancels your order. No, no, I, I mean that. I mean that. You know, when we were, the day we paid our building off, we announced that everybody celebrated. Did you know that from that week on, the tithing went because people believe, well, I don't need to tithe anymore. You're not tithing for the church. You're tithing for you and your family. Somebody give the Lord a praise. And I don't know where they got that mindset. And it happens everywhere. Somebody say to me, Pastor, get back to the sermon. Come on, say to me, Pastor, get back to the sermon. Okay, I will, I'm sorry. Whatever. And so let me tell you something. When you're hurting, I knew, I knew, I knew, just as a Christian, not only as a pastor, I knew I knew that right there and then that I had to hurry up and I had to hurry and get into the house of God. I knew that. And so let me tell you something. You cannot keep me out of the house of God. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of God of the Lord and the reason you cannot keep me out because the more I'm in the house of God the more my strength is renewed the more I can mount up and I will run and I will not faint can somebody be, give God a thank you praise that's an incredible incredible promise that God has given us. Listen, when life is not being fair, don't stay away from church. It's suicide, spiritual suicide. When life is not being fair, don't stay away from church and say stuff where it's like, well, you know, I'm just working it out on my own, Lord. And I know, I know what some of you think. Well, Pastor, a lot of times it doesn't make sense. I'm hurting, and it just don't make sense to me. And to be honest with you, it doesn't all make sense to me either. Can I tell you something? God doesn't have to explain everything to us. God does not have to explain everything to us. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, go, and when you go, this will happen. So all you've got to do is get yourself up, get your pretty little self down to the house of God, and let God do what he said he would do. He doesn't need your brain to try to figure out how he's going to do it. 
why it works. Just hear me when I say it just works. So get to the house of God. Stay in the house of God. Be diligent in the house of God. Don't run from God. And people get prideful when they're running from God. And they'll tell you. They won't hesitate. To, I'm running from God. So I take about four steps back in case lightning comes. I don't want God to, I don't want God to miss my... You know. He is over 2,000 years old. Maybe he needs you know, glasses. No. Of course not. Of course not. And then people tell you, well, I'm not going because it's full of hypocrites. Well, one more won't hurt. <laughs> we at Destiny love every hypocrite that's here, even that pastor. And so we're big enough to love one more hypocrite. Amen. Don't stay away from church. Well, I'm mad at God. I take 10 steps back because there's probably going to be three lightning bolts for that one. <laughs> I'm mad at God. And they're very frank. Obviously, they don't know God. They know of God, but they don't know God. Knowing of God is not going to get you through situations when life just isn't fair. Knowing God will get you through any situation when life isn't fair. So I begin to do that and I continue to do that at every opportunity. And the next thing, Jesus reminded me of John chapter 11. And again, a very familiar verse. Many of you already know the story. But in John chapter 11, Jesus finds out that Lazarus um, and how, how, uh, uh, is dying. And now they, they begin to seek him because Lazarus is very sick. Now this is someone Jesus really cares about. And so after several days, Jesus makes it to the town where Lazarus is. Follow me so. In John eleven eighteen, 18, it reads, Now Bethany, and Bethany, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of her brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Verse 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, my brother, would not have died. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Now get this, verse 22. But I know that even now, God, I, I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Now, she's pretty smart. And what she's doing here is, she doesn't really say it, but she's hinting towards something. <coughs> Can you kind of feel that in the scripture? She's kind of, trying to get somewhere without really saying it. And she says, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. He did die, but now you're here. And whatever you ask the father, I know that he'll give it to you. Are you catching what I'm trying to say, Jesus? Are you catching what I'm hinting to? I'm hinting to something. And Jesus responds, watch this, verse 23. Jesus responds, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. <coughs> your brother will rise again. And look at what Martha said in verse 24. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at that last day. Now there's, there's, there's a tremendous lesson here that I, that, that I don't want you to miss. And sometimes it's really difficult to understand this and to see this. She hints to Jesus that he could do something about Lazarus being dead. And she, and, and, and she hints towards that. And Jesus responds after her, uh, her response is really good. I honestly think that she 
could have said, well, I know that he'll rise again, period, but I understand where she went. But yet notice that in Martha's conversation with Jesus, that Martha did a lot that we could do if we're not careful. And I understand why. Martha said, if you had been here, things would have worked out differently, Jesus. Well, I've never said that. Well, maybe not like that. But if you ever got really God, you're saying if you would have been here. God, I, I, you know, I, 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 what you're saying is if you would have really been here. Folks, folks, baby Christians and older Christians alike. Folks, listen to this tremendous promise. Listen, listen. I will not leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you always, even until the end of time. When do you think he left you? See, we treat that Sunday school stuff. No. Those are words of life that Jesus said and Jesus promised. Where in your mind do you think he ever left you? He never did. And this is where, follow me, this is where, Mar this is where Martha's going and this is where she's pointing to. And oftentimes when, 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 when life just doesn't play along, listen to me, your natural emotional tendency is, is to go to the past right away or to go to the future. But where, where, where you don't want to go is the present. And I'll tell you why you don't want to go there. Because that's where the pain is. But when life just isn't fair, you've got to let Jesus in. you got to let him in because Jesus is a now God. Say now. now. And you've got to let him into your now present situation, not the past. You, you, you've got to let him into your now moment, into the room where all this pain is. You've got to let him uh, uh, go into this moment, this right here, right now moment. You've got to let him in. He is the now God. Follow me, follow me, please follow me. I got to get through this. I got to get through this. It's my assignment. Let's look at what Jesus said in verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am. I am. I am. I'm saying that because I like the way it sounds. I am. I am. And I know we're so used to Jesus saying the phrase, I am. We're used to him saying, I'm the bread of life. Uh, 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 I'm, 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 I'm the tree of life. I'm the living water. Uh, I'm this and I'm that. And we're used to that. But if you, have, if you had been there in that day, in that area, hear me, hear me, look what happened. And you, you were raised in the Jewish tradition. You would know, you would have known that when Jesus said, I am, every person within the sound of his voice, every ear opened up. Why? Because they knew where that phrase came from. And nobody talked like that. Nobody used that phrase. You need to understand that phrase was reserved uh, for the book of Exodus when Moses is standing in front of a bush that's burning and the bush is talking and Moses says, who do I say sent me? And a voice, remember, they come out of the bush, tell them I am sent you. And that's the Hebrew word for Yahweh, deliverer, Yahweh. That's a Hebrew word. That's a Hebrew word for Yahweh. Jesus, Redeemer, Deliverer, and Savior. Redeemer, Deliverer, and Savior. That part of the Godhead that was speaking to Moses that day in that bush, we know him as Jesus, but they knew him as Yahweh. Deliverer, Restorer, and Savior. 
Yahweh, say Yahweh. Yahweh. The hand of grace. And he said, I am. I am the same God that was in the burning bush. The same God that was in the burning bush is standing right in front of you right now. Oh, I don't believe that. The same God that was in that burning bush, the same God, the same Spirit of God, all that he was, Yahweh, Redeemer, Deliverer, and Savior, he is standing in this house, and he's standing right in front of you right now. I am, he said. John eleven twenty five. 25, I am the resurrection. Now please write this down. Is this helping anybody? Is this helping you? He said, I am the resurrection. Listen, the word resurrection in the Greek, Jesus said concerning the resurrection, Jesus said, I am the stand up and the recovery. Resurrection. I am the stand up and I am the recovery. I am the stand up and I'm the recovery. I am the stand up and I am the recovery. I am the stand up and I am the recovery. I am the stand up and I am the recovery. I am the stand up and I am the recovery. I am the stand up. And I am the recovery. I am the stand up. And I am the recovery. I am the stand up. And I am the recovery. I am the stand up. And I am, I am, I am, I am the stand up. And I am your recovery. I am the resurrection. Oh, oh, I'm the stand up and the recovery. I'm the stand up and the recovery. Notice what Jesus said here. I am the stand up and the recovery. And some of you here, the unfairness of life has knocked you down. Huh. You feel like you've been hit by a train and you're down and you come and you hear all of this and you go up to your pastor and we're sincere when we tell you you know you've got to get up again and I'm going to be honest with you sometimes I don't know if I can get it up again sometimes you don't know if you can get up You've tried to get up, but you can't get up. Can I give you a good word right here? You don't have to get up. All you've got to do is let him that is in you do what he is. He is your stand-up, and he is your recovery. Let him that is in you stand up in you. And let him come up on the inside of you. And turn to him and say, you are my stand up. You are my recovery. And then you picture him on the inside. Right now, right now, this very moment. And you may, you may, you may be down on the ground. But let him come up on the inside of you. And when he comes up. Guess who's coming up with him? You are. You're coming up too. You don't have to stay down there. Life would want you to stay down there. You, you got to let him come up in you. And you're going to come up with him. And I'm here to tell you God will bring you up 
God will stand you up and God will recover it for you. He is your stand up. He is your recovery. I am the resurrection, he said. And the reason you can't do it, because he is, not us, not you, he is the stand up and the recovery. Then he said, get ready, get ready, watch this. Then he said, then he said, you still happy? Then he said, I am the stand up and the recovery and I am the resurrection and the life. Write this down, write this down. The Greek word for life is, this is really powerful. Jesus is saying, I am the life that satisfies. The word life there reads, I am the life that satisfies. You don't need anybody or anything as much as you need Jesus. Because he is the life. He is the life that satisfies. Turn to your neighbor and tell you, tell them, he is the life that satisfies. And Jesus is saying, I am the life that satisfies and I'm dwelling on the inside of you. I am the life that satisfies. Now I'm going to say something and please hear me when I say this because if you don't hear what I say, you're going to think to yourself, man, he's not a very nice man. And I am a very nice man. I want you to know. I say this with much love as I can stir up. You need to hear this. I remember that during those months I, that I shared about earlier, there were many days when I couldn't sleep. And I have to admit to you that oftentimes I'd be up crying and and these verses that I've shared with you, they begin to come alive on the inside of me. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, and one night, Jesus stood up in me. And he has not sat back down. So this became a very real thing to me. This became very powerful in me after realizing how in many ways I had neglected the life that satisfies part. So after looking at it again with a determined focus, I began to meditate on it. And Jesus said, I am the life that satisfies you, son. I am the life that satisfies. What else are you looking for? When life is not fair, what else is there to look for than the life that satisfies? It's not in the drugs. It's not in the alcohol. It's not at the club. It's not getting angry with God. It's not about leaving church or not going to church. It has nothing to do with those things. Those things would not satisfy, uh, uh, not the drugs in there, but church would not satisfy you if the life that satisfies is not dwelling in you. I am the life that satisfies. And please understand that This is so powerful to me. In many ways, I'm so grateful to God for that revelation to me. But also understand that with my sisters, my sister-in-law, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, my mom, my dad, and many of you are here that have had loss, have loved ones go to be with the Lord. My sisters, they had a large part of my heart. My mother, my father, my sister-in-law, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law. You have no idea. They had a large part of my heart, a very large part of my heart. 
And at times to this day, I find myself missing them terribly. And yet, and yet, here's the reality. Somebody say, Pastor, we really love you. Here's the reality. As much as they all gave me, they didn't give me life. One day they all left me, but Jesus has never left me. And he's still here. And he is, listen to me, you've got to get this. I had to focus, and you have to focus also, that he is the life that satisfies. Jesus began to move towards the tomb where Lazarus is in John eleven thirty eight, He begins to move towards the tomb. Then Jesus again groaning, say groaning. I won't be much longer. Jesus, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. Now watch this, watch this. The Greek word for the word groaning, are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Means to be indignant. It means to roar. And some of you here this morning need to get your roar back. I said some of you need to get your roar back. You need to become indignant about what happened to you. You cannot allow yourself to be pushed into a passive acceptance of life not being fair. You've got to get indignant. The word indignant means to be aroused by anger due to injustice. That's what the word indignant, indignant. See, in my opinion, What happened in those two months and other instances before that should not have happened. And I'm still angry about it. And this is the really the first time I've openly confessed this. And so now, now I've now made up my mind that I'm going to live the rest of my life with a vengeance. I'm asking God to bear so much fruit in my life like he's never bared it before. Hallelujah. And I'm going to go after what is rightfully mine in Christ. I'm going to go after it with a vengeance. Don't be like hundreds and hundreds of other people that I have personally seen come to funerals. Uh, uh, the funeral of their wife, their child, their husband, and other loved ones. And they come and they leave and nothing changes in their life. The years that I have, I made up my mind. I'm going to live with a vengeance by asking God, bear more fruit in my life. I'm going to live by doing more for God. I'm going to do more. I'm going to accomplish more. I'm going to do what Jesus did in Matthew 14 when they killed his cousin, John the Baptist. He went out and immediately began to heal the sick. Some people, and I love you, Won't come out of the house for days. Because they know of God. But they don't know God. Some people wear black for months. Because they know God. But they don't know of God. The life that satisfies. The one that will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus didn't stop his ministry. Jesus didn't stop going to church. Jesus didn't get mad at God the Father. Jesus didn't question God the Father. 
the day his cousin John the Baptist was beheaded, he immediately wound out, went out and healed the sick. And I believe that many of us here need to stand up during that time that life just isn't fair and say, oh yeah, life, oh yeah, devil, watch me go and evangelize. Watch me go and get somebody saved. I'm gonna double up on my prayer time. I'm gonna double up in my reading. I'm gonna double up in my worship to God. Hey! Hey! And so you've got to get your roar back. Am I helping? Is the Holy Ghost helping anybody today? You've got to get spiritually indignant. Well, is that biblical? To be spiritually indignant? Well, the kingdom of God suffers. The kingdom of God suffers. And those that are of God do what? Take it back how? By force. By force. Not by staying away. Not by running from God. But coming together before the Lord. With the rest of the gathering, where you will renew your strength, you'll fly as eagles, you'll walk, and I'll think you'll run. These are the things that help me when life is unfair to me. In 2 Corinthians 11, I won't be there long. The Apostle Paul lists there, you need to go there and read it, these amazing uh, number of things that that he went through, he was beaten with stripes, he, and he, he was beaten with, rod, with rods, he was stoned, he was shipwrecked, he was stolen from by friends, by robbers, by church people, he was lied on, you need to go back and read that rest of the list, it's an astonishing list, but there's one thing, hear me, look, look, there's one thing in that list that Paul never said, are you ready for this? Come on, are you ready for this? Turn to your neighbor and say, you can't handle the truth, I would tell him. He names all that stuff that happened to him. But there's one thing he did not say. Paul never said, why me? Why me? Now personally, I think he could have said that. He could have easily looked in life and said, really, Jesus? Really? Why is life treating me like this? Why, why is this going on? Why me? He could have easily said that. I've had all these things happen to me, Paul is saying. In addition, he goes on to say, I've got to take care of all these churches that are under me. Why me? As a matter of fact, Lord, why not Peter? Why not Peter, Lord? After all, he's the one that denied you. Everybody's going around, oh, Peter, oh, Peter. And Paul's over here getting beat up. So he says, why not Peter? Then he says, well, you know what, Lord? Forget Peter. How about doubting Thomas? He didn't believe you had resurrected. Peter denied you. Thomas didn't believe you had resurrected until he felt the, the, the holes in your uh, palm of your hand, the hole, and, 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 but other than that, he didn't believe you. Why not those two guys? Paul never said that. He never said, why me? But very quickly, let me tell you something. See, what all that life tried to do to me or did to me, it's all helped me get my perspective right with God. Because I accepted the fact that, you know what? I'm not the only one that this has happened to. Oh, hear me now. And I won't be the last. And you have to accept that all the universe did not align against you and is now fighting you. Hallelujah. And what happened to our sisters is, is what happened to my sisters and what happened to Lola and what happened to uh, 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 
uh, all, all your loved ones that have gone to be with the Lord, whatever has happened to them. Oh, God. Is between, is between the Lord and them. Whatever has happened to them is between the Lord and them. Our fathers, our husbands, our friends, our children, our wives. It's not about me and him. It's about them and him. Can somebody just, maybe just clap? It sounds really good on YouTube. And what happened with them and him, are you ready for this? What happened with them and him, what happened between them and him, is none of my business. Unless, unless I never witnessed to them. Unless I never told them about Jesus. Unless I've never invited them to church. Unless I never told them the plan of salvation. Then maybe I didn't love them that much. God, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Maybe... I didn't love them that much to tell them about the life that satisfies the resurrection himself, Jesus Christ. Other than that, what's happened between them and the Lord is not my business. What my business is, what happens between me and the Lord. And what is important to you is what happens between you and the Lord. Paul didn't say about Peter and the joker Thomas. Paul said, Lord, you and me. You and me. Okay, so one, one last one. 1 Samuel chapter 30. You know the story. David's in Ziklag. He's on the run from Saul and he goes off to help the Philistines fight against Israel. The Philistines don't let him. So he comes back to Ziglat. It's a day and a half going and a day and a half coming. And verse 1 says, Now it happened that when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag and, Ziglag and attacked Ziglag and burned it down with fire and had taken captive, watch this, the women and those who were there from small to great. They didn't kill anybody, but carried them away, and they went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire. Watch this, watch this. And their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him, watch, lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. I don't know if you've ever been there. 1 Chronicles 29 tells us that at this part, at this stage of his life, David, David was right before God when all of this happened to him. Now you can't say that about David's life all the time, but at this time when this happened, he was living right before the Lord when this happened. But here's the reality. Sometimes really bad stuff happens to really good people. Why, Pastor? I don't know. And I really don't want to concern myself with things that are too wonderful for me. But I do concern myself with how I'm going to respond. Because like it or not, Friday is coming. And you better be ready for it. Life keeps coming. And how you respond to it. Now look what happens here. Since they wept until they had no more power to weep. And again, we've all been there one time or another. 
Some of you are still there today. And it seems like every time I went there, by the grace and the power of God, I had the power to weep. And I can't imagine coming to a place where you've wept so much that there's no more power to weep. But that's where these men were. And that's where some of you are this morning. Now listen, here's what happens. Now David was greatly distressed, so David's day comes from bad to worse, watch. For the people spoke of stoning him. Really? Because the soul of all the people was grieved, watch. Every man for his sons and his daughters, but David, say but David. Get this, everybody's in the same spot, get this. Everybody's get, uh, uh, grieving and weeping. Everybody's sad, everybody's heart is torn. And I mean, can you imagine their wives, their sons, daughters, all their possessions, their houses are burned. And if you ask me, that's a pretty lousy day. It's a pretty lousy way that life is just not being fair for David and his men. And it said that they all wept together. Listen, listen. But something happened. Something happened. They're going down the same road emotionally. They're going down the same road. Now watch what happened. They're going down the same road and they come to crossroads. They come to crossroads. And David's men take one path. And the, and the Bible says, but David, the, the, the rest of the men went one way. And, but, but David, so that means David took a different path. The men that were with David, the Bible said they were grieved. But in the Hebrew text, it says they became bitter. And bitter in the dictionary means they became intensely hostile. Bitterness. Now there are two negative emotions in the human heart that the Bible refers to as having a root. Number one is the love of money. Not money. The love of money. Number two is bitterness. And I feel like I've got to tell you that you've got to be so careful with bitterness in your life, Destiny Community Church. Because you may get bitter in one area of your life 20 years from now. That bitterness is going to be in many areas of your life because it's those roots that will spread into other areas of your life. And for right now, maybe people are putting up with your bitterness, but 10 years from now, they won't. You know why? Because they're getting tired of your hostility. They're getting tired of you being angry. They're getting tired of you being mad. And that bitterness will affect your life. It'll suck you under. And if you've got it in your life today, and you may be able to justify it, but you've got to allow Jesus to take his word and dig those roots out of your heart. Because if you don't, you're going to end up by yourself. David saw it. And David went another direction. Write it down. Write this down. It says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. What did he do? But David encouraged himself in the Lord. The word Lord here is a Hebrew word for Yahweh. Remember? Say Yahweh. Remember he went to the what? Deliverer, Redeemer, Savior. He didn't go to El Shaddai. He didn't go to Jehovah Rapha. He didn't go to Jehovah. He went to Yahweh. He went to the Redeemer, the Deliverer, and the Savior. That's how he encouraged himself. Now, he didn't understand like we do, but he acted on what he understood, and he went to the Redeemer, Deliverer, Savior. He went to Yahweh. And he went to him and encouraged himself in Yahweh. He encouraged himself. We would say, Jesus. Now, real quickly, the word encourage has two definitions. I'm almost done. It means to be fastened 
to him. He encouraged himself in the Lord. He fastened himself to God. He didn't run from God. He didn't blame God. No, he went to God and he fastened himself to him. And he didn't want to let go. Encouraged. He fastened himself to God. Why are we so quick to let go of God when life isn't fair? Why do we let go of God? You're to encourage yourself like David. You're to fasten yourself to the Lord. Say fasten. Say it again. He fastened himself to God. Watch this. Watch this. The sec second Hebrew word for encouragement means that David... Uh, Chose to be recovered. He didn't choose to be sad. I'm not being mean. I'm just sharing with you what helped me. He didn't choose to whine. He didn't choose to complain. He didn't choose to murmur or question God. No, he didn't do any of that. He chose to be recovered. David chose to be recovered. David chose to be recovered. Yes, that's how that part hit me. As I meditated, it shook me. It said, right here, say right here. Right here, right now. If David can do it, I said to me, Charlie can do it right here, right now. I choose to be recovered from this I choose right here right now this very moment I choose to be recovered why did I do that because you Lord are my stand up and you are my recovery and right here right now right here right now I choose to be recovered. You should do it too. And that's, that's the night that I decided I'm back. I actually never left, but but you've got to do it too, Pastor. <laughs> I can't. I know you can't. That's why you are not the stand-up and the recovery. He's the stand-up and the recovery. And that's why he took it out of your hands and put it in his hands. Now watch what happens. Verse 8. David inquired of the Lord. Shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Say two things. Say two things. Now I'm not being ugly. And I'm not judging anybody. It's just that this really helped me. And I've been praying that it would help you. David didn't say, David didn't say, Lord, help me live with this. David didn't say, Lord, teach me how to accept this. No. He said, Lord, since I've recovered, do you want me to go after these guys? Because I've recovered, Lord. I'm ready to get back in the game. Now notice what God says to him. He said, yes. Now what David did was ask for, he asked for two things. Shall I pursue the Lord? And shall I overtake? And look at what God said in verse 8. Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake. And of course you know that God works exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think according to the power that works within us. David asked two things, but God's going to give him three. God said, you shall pursue you shall certainly overtake. Now watch this, watch this. And sh you shall recover all. <laughs> now 
sometimes I don't think I have any idea what recovery means in my life. But I'll tell you something. I've decided that I'm not going to try to define it. I'm going to let God, who is the stand-up in the recovery, define recovery to me. But I know this. I know this. He is my stand-up in my recovery. And so listen, this morning, I would encourage you, don't try and define recovery. Let the recoverer himself define recovery in your life. Please stand and raise your hands to heaven. <laughs> I love you so much. I want to thank you for giving me the freedom to share this with you. It was confirmed and ignited to me listening to Frida White. We so love her. There are a few people here that God has stepped into your life today. You know him in a new way. And I believe that he's come up to you this morning in the form of his word. He is the word. And I believe he's going to do something phenomenal, some phenomenal things in your life from this day on. Lift your hands to heaven. Lift your hands to heaven. Jesus, I pray for your people today. And I know that there's some people here today that life just hasn't been fair to. And Lord, there may be some who are struggling with the passing of a loved one, maybe the loss of a business, maybe the loss of a ministry. I don't know, Lord. But I pray that you reach into the heart right here, right now. And I pray that they choose today, right here, right now, that they choose to be recovered. That they no longer go through life with a limp. There's some here who the devil has told them, Lord, that, that there's no way back. And I'm asking you today, that for those that can't get up on their own, that you stand up in them. Jesus, stand up in us. Cause us to recover all. Cause us to get up and walk because you are renewing our strength. You are my life that satisfies. We're like eagles now. We're not just dead meat. We're like eagles mounted up because of you, Jesus. So today I pray, heal and restore. You see every hand that's been raised, Lord. Heal and restore. Encourage, bless, renew, recover, restore, strengthen empower fix every life everyone and if you're here today and life just hasn't been fair to you life's just beat up on you I just want you to say with your mouth right here and right now right here and right now I want you to say with your mouth I choose to be recovered no, 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 no. You got to be indignant. Angry because life's treated you unfair. Spiritually, you got to be indignant and you have to draw a line and you have to let the devil and everybody know that today I choose to be Recovered. Now say it again. Say it again. Say it again. I choose to be recovered. I choose to be recovered. Right here. 
right now. I choose to be recovered. I'm not getting better. I am better. I choose right here, right now to be recovered. One more time, say this, right here. No, 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 no. Right here. Right, here. right, now. right now. I choose to be recovered. This is my day of independence. I choose to be recovered. Give the Lord a praise. You may be Come on, give the Lord a praise. Come on, give the Lord a praise. Oh, thank you, Lord, I'm recovered. Thank you, Lord, I'm recovered. Thank you that you never left me. In the name of Jesus.